In this video, I'm going to show you how to value stocks of companies that pay dividends. Now, I chose the company Procter & Gamble for this example. And the reason is that according to its 10K, Procter & Gamble's been paying a dividend for 133 consecutive years since the company was founded in 1890, as of the time I'm making this video. So this company regularly pays dividends, so I think it'd be a great way to use the dividend discount model to value a firm. Now, you don't have to use that model to value a stock that pays dividends. You could make a DCF model. You could use residual income valuation. But I think this company is a natural fit to use the dividend discount model. Okay, so we're going to do dividends-based valuation. And we're going to follow this process here. We're going to follow these steps. Okay, we're going to start out by determining what is our forecast horizon. Now, that is the amount of time that we're going to be forecasting the dividends for specific years. So specific, So as of the time I'm making this, uh, I did this, it was uh, early February of 2024. So I have the expected info for 2024, 2025, 2026. So this is a three-year forecast horizon. Okay, this year right here, don't get confused by that. That's the first year outside of our forecast horizon. We'll, we'll come back to that. But I've got 2024, 2025, 2026. It didn't have to be a three-year forecast horizon. It could have been five-year, could have been 10-year, okay? You basically want to forecast where the final year is what we call steady state, like a normal year uh, for, the, for the company. So I chose a three-year forecast horizon, okay? So that's the first step. Determine what your forecast horizon is going to be, five years, seven years, 10. Okay, the next step forecast the company's net income attributable to common shareholders. When you just hear net income, people think a lot of things, but net income attributable to common shareholders is net income minus any income attributable to non-controlling interests minus any preferred dividends. Now, if you just look at Procter & Gamble's income statement, if you see net income uh, attributable uh, to Procter & Gamble, that would be net income minus income attributable to non-controlling interests. But preferred dividends is not subtracted from that, so you need to look up their preferred dividends and subtract that as well. Okay, obviously, if a company does not have any preferred stock, you would not need to subtract uh, preferred dividends. So we've got, I've got here historical data for 2021, 2022, 2023. The A next to the year indicates this is actual data, right? Here, the E next to, it indicates it's expected. So that's my forecast. We'll get to that in a moment. But this is the historical net income attributable to Procter & Gamble's common shareholders. And so this is not including income attributable, not controlling interest. We've excluded uh, preferred dividends from this. Okay, and again, these amounts are in millions. So this number right here, that's 14.371 billion net income attributable to Procter & Gamble's common shareholders for 2023. Now, so we're going to forecast that. Where will we come up with that net income figure? We would have a forecasted uh, income statement for Procter & Gamble. Now, I'm not going to do that here. I'm trying to keep this video a reasonably uh, a reasonable length. Okay, but you would have a forecasted income statement that, and then net income attributable common shareholders would drop out from that. Now, note that some people will use comprehensive income instead of net income. So I use net income, but you might see uh, people do other things. Now, step three, we're going to need to forecast the dividend payout ratio. Okay, now here's the historical dividend payout ratio for Procter & Gamble. And you see it's been trending upward over time, 57, 59, 61. Uh, if you're wondering what is the dividend payout ratio, uh, we take the amount of dividends paid to common shareholders, divide that by the net income attributable to common shareholders. So it's saying like what percentage of that net income figure uh, is, being, is being paid out. So I just forecasted here 2024, 62%, 63, 64, 65. Okay, I'm not saying these are perfect forecasts. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how this would go. I just noticed that it's trending upward. I assume it will continue uh, to trend upward. Now, we also, <clears throat> so we've got, so, so we got our, our payout ratio. The next thing is calculate the dividends paid to common shareholders, the forecasted amount, right? So that's this right here. We need to calculate that. We forecast the payout ratio first, and then you multiply the pay. So this 62% times the forecast and net income attributable to P uh, Procter & Gamble's common shareholders, that gives us the forecasted amount of dividends paid to common shareholders. So that's, that's step four. That's where that came from. Step five, we're getting to the amount uh, that Procter & Gamble is expected to spend repurchasing its own stock. So we've got right here, repurchases of common shares. 
Now, I've got $9 billion for 2024. Uh, where did I get that from? Actually, I went to a press release here for Procter & Gamble, and they explicitly said they expected to repurchase, uh, spend about $9 billion repurchasing common stock in 2024. That's where I got that figure from. Uh, for 2025, 2026, I just assume uh, that it would in increase a little bit. Proceeds from issuing common stock. Now that is treated as ultimately like a, like a negative dividend in a way, uh, because that would be the company getting money from uh, common shareholders. Uh, they have not done that in the past few years, so I assume that would continue to be zero. Now, here's the thing. For purposes of dividends-based valuation, when we're using a dividend discount model, most people do not just discount the amount of Div uh, dividends paid to common shareholders. They also treat repurchases of common shares as dividends. Because if you think about it, buying back common share, the, buying back shares from common shareholders is just another way of distributing capital to common shareholders. You could you could pay them a dividend. You could repurchase their shares. So when you have dividends based valuation, a lot of times people will treat common sh repurchases of common shares as quote unquote dividends. So when we calculate this figure here, okay, that's going to include not just the dividends paid to common shareholders. I'm adding in the share repurchases and then subtracting any negative dividends or issuing, like if they get money from common shareholders, right? So this is paying money to the common shareholders. This is paying money to common shareholders. This would be getting money from common shareholders, but it's zero for Procter & Gamble. So that's what we got. This plus this minus this equals this. Now, here's the forecasted amounts, okay? We've got for 2024, 2025, 2026. Now, again, I also made a forecast for 2027. So if you're getting you know, kind of confused, you say, hey, you say it was a three-year forecast horizon. Uh, this is like the first year, 2027 is the first year outside the forecast horizon. We're gonna treat that as the first, th this amount here, the 20.311 billion of dividends, that's gonna be assumed to be the first dividend stream like payment in a perpetual stream of dividends so we're going to treat that as a growing uh perpetuity so we've done step five we forecasted common share repurchases we did step six uh, forecasting proceeds from stock issuances uh, and then we did step seven uh calculating this this was just based on uh just this plus this minus this equals this okay so that's how we came up with the forecasted uh dividends Okay, so now we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click, I'm gonna go to a different worksheet now, but what you're gonna see is the forecasted dividends here, th these, these amounts, I'm gonna discount each of those back to their present value. This is assumed to occur one year into the future. Okay, I'm gonna discount that back to its present value, so discount it back one period. This one I'm gonna discount back two periods because it's happening two years from now. This one I'm gonna discount back three years. And then this is going to be treated as a growing perpetuity, the first dividend in a stream of perpetual dividends. So that's going to be what we call, we're going to discount that. It's going to be called our continuing value or terminal value. And then we're going to discount that back three periods. Okay. So I'm going to jump on the next worksheet, but you're going to see the, these numbers here are going to be on that next worksheet. And, and here they are. Okay. So if you're wondering where these numbers came from right here, they came from the prior worksheet. So I'm, I'm going to highlight those ones just so you can see. Okay. And then this number right here also came from the prior worksheet. Again, I'm going to go back to 2311. That's just the first, like once we get outside the three-year forecast horizon, that's the very first set of dividends for the first year outside the three-year forecast horizon. We're going to use that to calculate our terminal value, aka continuing value. So we've got dividends for these periods. Now I said here, so I'm taking the present value. Now to, to do that, right? Remember you take, you just take this number divided by one plus R to the nth power where N is the number of periods. So this is one year in the future. So I'm, to, now, now what's our R for discounting? I'm gonna assume a 7% cost of equity for Procter & Gamble, okay? If you wonder how do you calculate the cost of equity, you can do that using a capital asset pricing model. So what I've got is this number here divided by one plus R, which is 7%, so 1.07 to the nth power, which it's, it's just one year into the future, okay? So this divided by 1.07 to the first power equals this. And you can see the formula right up here that I've got, okay? Now, for year the second year of our forecast horizon, now we're gonna take that divided by one plus R to the second power. 
okay? Because it's occurring two years into the future. And then this one is three years in the future. So this is 19,453 divided by 1.07 to the third power. That's where these numbers came from. Okay, these are present value. I've got videos on how to calculate present value. There's the present value of a single sum for each of these if you are not familiar with that. Because remember, these dividends are occurring in the future. Dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future. So we had to discount them to a present value. Add these three things up and we get the sum of the discounted dividends for those three years, okay, a little over $49 billion. Now, Again, I'm assuming that each of these dividends occur at the end of the year. So like that 18.177 billion happens at the end of 2024. This one happens at the end of 2025. Some people do mid-year uh, uh, adjustments uh, for discounting. So if you Google mid-year adjusting, uh, you know, I can make another video where I talk about that. Or you know, I'm not going to get into that here. I'm just going to assume that dividends each occur at the end of the year. I understand that that's not always the case. Dividends occur quarterly in many cases. So, so I don't want to get into it. I'm just trying to keep this simple. Okay, so this is the sum, present value, discounted value of the dividends for 2024, 2025, 2026 that we forecasted. Now, we need to say, well, look, Procter & Gamble, we're assuming it's going to continue on beyond 2026. And so what we're going to assume is we're going to say, look, in 2027, there's going to be a dividend uh, a flow, right? There's going to be more dividends. And we already calculated that. We did a forecast for that for 2027, okay? So we, we came up with this amount here, $20.311 billion. So now what we're going to do is we're going to treat that as a perpetual stream of dividend. Like there's, we assume just 2027 and beyond, Procter & Gamble is going to have an infinite stream of dividend every year. And it's going to increase by 2% every year forever. Some people go with 3%, some people 2.5%. You don't want something ridiculous for your terminal growth rate like 8% or something like that. This, this is way too high. So 2 or 3%. Here I've got 2%. So now the continuing value or terminal value, I've got the formula here. Okay, so so let me let me go back. I just just to make sure. I've got, step one. I have the formulas here. I already already walked you through that of you know dividing by one plus r and so forth. Okay, but the terminal value, which we're at now, we take the dividends for the first year outside the forecast horizon, which was three year forecast horizon, so 2027. So that first year, so that's I'm gonna put. I got that here as D4. Okay, dividends for year four, okay, divided by R, our discount rate, so the cost of equity, 0 0.07, minus the growth rate, which we're assuming here 2% growth. That, like, that's the rate at which these dividends are going to grow every year forever. So 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.0, or excuse me, minus 0 0.02. So we're going to have 0 0.05 in the denominator here. So we just pay 2311 divided by 0 0.05, okay? So that's where I came up with this. And if you take a look, you see the formula here. Okay, that's just this divided by 0.05 okay, is going to be equal to this. Now, I want to note, right? I want to note before I go further. Some people, when they do for 2027, what would be the dividends? Instead of, so that 20.311 billion that I got back here, okay? Some people, when they do that, what they would do for the first year outside the forecast horizon, instead of doing another, uh, like forecasting the payout ratio and everything, they just they just find it easier. They just go, you know what? Actually, we're going to set the first year outside the forecast horizon. We're just going to say it's equal to that amount, the dividends for the prior year, times one plus the growth rate, which the growth rate for the perpetuity we said was 2%. So that would result in a different amount, right? So if, if you know somebody who does, or you, you prefer that method, go ahead. I just want to make you aware that a lot of people do that because that's easier. Then you don't have to worry about forecasting the payout ratio and stuff like that. Okay, some people can make the argument this is more accurate for that first year out the forecast uh, uh, after the forecast horizon to actually go and for forecast the payout ratio and all that. But again, some people would just say, "You know what? Hey, let's just take this one right here, the last year the last year of dividends, multiply it by 1 plus the growth rate, and then instead of 2311, they'd have 19842." Okay? So, I just want to mention that cuz you you'll see that in diversity in practice. Now, getting back we got our forecast of dividends. We divide it by R minus G, okay, because we assume we, that we're treating this as the first uh, dividend in a perpetual series of dividends that's going to grow at 2% forever. So this divided by 0 0.07 minus 0 0.02 is this amount, 406 billion. Okay, now here's the thing. 
that is that continuing value that now needs to be discounted back three periods, right? Because we have a three year forecast horizon because this is the continuing value right here. This 406.213 billion. That's the continuing value as of if we're standing there at the end of 2026 and we're looking forward and saying, okay, we've got this infinite stream of dividends coming. What's the value of it as of that point? So that's as of end of 2026. So, <coughs> excuse me, we need to go and say, okay, what's the value of that? Take that back three periods. So take that, divide by one plus R to the third power. Okay, the number of periods is the amount of the forecast horizon. So that divided by 1.07 to the third power is 331 billion. That's the present value of the continuing value. And again, the continuing value is the value outside beyond that three year horizon. So the value of the dividends Procter & Gamble is gonna throw off after 2026, 331.591 billion. The value of dividends for 2024, 2025, 2026, 49.296 billion. Add those together, total value of the dividends, like discounted value, 380.886 billion. Divide that by the number of common shares outstanding, okay? We get the estimated value per common share of Procter & Gamble, $161.58. Okay, now we compare that to the company's actual stock price. You look up what is the actual value per common share of Procter & Gamble. Now, when I did this analysis, uh, the most recent date was uh, f th that there was a uh, stock price date for was Friday, February 9th, 2024. Uh, back when I did this, so $157.42 was the actual stock price of Procter & Gamble. And we see our estimated value per common share, $161.58. Now, generally speaking, if your estimated value is greater than the actual value, so you go and you do an analysis and you say, you know what, actually the estimated value, the intrinsic value I've calculated is much higher than what the stock is trading at. You would say the company is undervalued. Okay, now, if it went the other way, if you said, well, the estimated value is much lower than what the stock is trading at, you say the stock is overvalued. Okay, so uh, now here, there's not that much of a difference uh, between them. So I would say, based on this, I uh, would say that it looks like uh, Procter & Gamble was fairly valued as of that date. Now, I will share, so this Excel spreadsheet uh, that I used here, uh, I will post on Patreon, and I'll also post it uh, uh, for uh, people who are members of the YouTube community.